Thank you for listening to The Leadership Shift. If you're listening to this, it's because you're an influencer. You know how to use your gifts to impact lives. And I just want you to continue to listen to this and share it with your team as you achieve your goals and as you make history. As a bonus, I wanted to share something special with you, which is a live presentation from my father and I, Les Brown, and myself speaking in Detroit, Michigan. This is the first time that we came back together after five years. And it's a very presentation, a very special presentation to me. And I'm happy to share it with you because this is a leadership shift. It's been a plum pleasing pleasure as well as a privilege. Make sure you go to my website, johnlesliebrown.com. That's J O H N hyphen L E S L I E brown.com. J O H N hyphen L E S L I E brown.com. I'm sure you've loved what you've heard in this presentation. So why don't you also go to Facebook, type in facebook.com slash it's not over until we win. Facebook.com slash it's not over until we win. Like the fan page and stay tuned because the best is yet to come. Thank you, Rick. Let's give him a round of applause if you please. All right. And let's give Ed Gucci and the choir a round of applause. They were awesome. I'm so glad to be here to be back home. I was just thinking as I was listening to the choir and, and Sue, that I met Sue Burkhardt here. How many years ago I met you, Sue? But, but I've been here, it was 21 years ago. First of all, stand up. And Sue came up to me and said, I'm going to work for you. Stand up. So give Sue a round of applause. And yeah, this is Sue. Sue Burkhardt. And so we've been, we've been working together for all these years. Yeah, 19 years, right, that you came. And you know what I was thinking about, about how time flies. Last time I was here, I had no gray hair at all. Show you how time flies. I got it this morning, took out my mascara to cover it. I say, I need a paintbrush now. <laughs> I'll tell you, see I, see, I have an allergic reaction to dye, so I use mascara to cover my gray. And so this, this gray hair just been rebelling, you know what I'm saying? No, no we want to be seen. <laughs> and, and my children said, Daddy, you look distinguished with your gray hair. I said, 65, I'm not trying to look distinguished. I'm trying to look young. <laughs> Oh, you feel the brother up in here, up in here. <laughs> and I saw a gentleman out in the lobby. He said, I'm so glad to see you. I said, it's good to be seen. <laughs> it's better to be seen than to be viewed. <laughs> and I'm also new medication, so y'all got to part me for a moment. <laughs> But I tell you, it, is, it just brought back some memories. I remember when I first came here, a friend of mine named Audrey Lewis was driving me by, and she said, that's the church of today. And Dr. Tataglia, Dr. T, he was coming out. He and I had just met. Repeat after me, please. Coincidence, Coincidence. is God's way. Of staying anonymous. Yeah. He and I had just met in a training in Dallas, Texas. I was pursuing my dream. Caught a Greyhound bus from Miami, Florida to Dallas, Texas. The money that I had saved prior to that trip, I had spent it because my mother was suffering with breast cancer. She was a 22-year breast cancer conqueror. And so I had to find a new way to earn money. I had uh, just resigned from the Ohio legislature in Columbus, Ohio. I was elected to my third term. I was the chairman of the Human Resource Committee. And I went back to Miami to fulfill this dream of taking care of my mother, who adopted seven children at age 46. And here this woman, with only a third grade education, 
she decided that she wanted to make a difference in, in the lives of some children. And there I was in the Ohio legislature, Rick, and, and I got a call from one of my brothers and said they're going to put mom in a nursing home. I, and I said, no, no, can't do that. Mama used to work in nursing home, always said she never wanted to go. And I just couldn't understand how one woman who raised seven children who couldn't raise and take care of themselves and seven grown people couldn't take care of one woman. I couldn't understand that. How many of you know that life is unpredictable? Raise your hands, please. Absolutely. There's some things that come that you can't see it coming and that you have to handle it. You have to deal with it. People are going through that right now. So I deal with that. Make a decision. Let us say, make a decision. I had to make a decision and I had to give up that which I was doing and very familiar with and was very easy for me to do. I enjoyed doing the legislature. I passed 14 bills my first term. It was exciting doing that. It was a new challenge for me. And I looked back and I was just thinking as I was listening to the choir sing the different areas of my life that gave birth to who I am right now. And, and it didn't happen easily. I want to share some thoughts with you, and I want you to think about some goals right now. There are people going through a lot of things, but I want you to repeat after me, please. Today, Today anything's, possible. anything's possible. I've got the power in me got power in to, me. Handle to handle whatever life throws at me. Throws See, I got it like that. Like that. Greater is he that is in me than he, he that's in the world. Shake someone's hand on your right and left, look me in the eye and say, you got the power. <laughs> I want you to think about some things that you'd like to achieve right now. I want you to think about some goals you'd like to achieve right now. This is a very special time in our history. Special time. And it's, it's amazing how people forget so quickly good things that happen. It's amazing how we can see some good stuff happen and then something bad happens and that overshadows all the good stuff instantly and cause people to start thinking totally different. And I want you to think about some goals right now that you want to achieve and I don't want you to allow the chatter in the marketplace, in the news, the television, CNN, constant negative news. I don't want any of that to filter your thoughts right now. I want you to think about some goals in three areas. I want you to think about some personal goal. My personal goal was to take care of my mother. I did that. I took care of her. So she's 89. I took care of her. That was the personal goal that I wanted. Mama used to work on Miami Beach, scrubbing floors, making up beds, cleaning homes. We ate the food left over from the families that she cooked for. It said, Mamie, whatever food's left over, you can pack it up and take it home to those seven children that you have adopted. And my mama could bake, too. Mama could bake a sweet potato pie so good you couldn't eat it with your shoes on. <laughs> <laughs> Had to take your shoes off so you could wiggle your toes. You, you feel the brother of it here, of it here. <laughs> and it was, a, it, it was a challenging time in our experience. It was a time, and I think about, we wore the hand-me-down clothes of the children that Mama kept. They were too large, Mama could sew. She'd take them up, and they were too small, she could let them out. Repeat after me, please. Recessions, Recessions. Restores, restores resourcefulness. People say we're going through a recession. Wow, is that right? <laughs> because a lot of people filing bankruptcy who've never done it before. You call that a recession? I remember we used to get a welfare box, and, and this welfare box, you had powdered milk. No matter what you did with it, it did taste like milk. <laughs> we had cheese, government cheese. I don't know y'all don't have that up here, but I'm talking about, I'm from Florida. We had, we had Spam, Spam in a can. We had barbecue Spam and fried Spam and 
Brawl spam and spam a la. <laughs> we had those bees. We ate the bees. We had to go to sleep with the windows open then. <laughs> People see you in the welfare line. Les, I don't know y'all on welfare. Oh, no, this is for my neighbor, Miss Curry. <laughs> I mean to tell you, we're so broke the roaches moved out. Y'all ain't got no food. You know? We out of here. <laughs> They call life a recession. I guess we were in a recession, but we didn't know it. <laughs> yeah, I know maybe you could call that reverse recession. You know, when creditors call a house and you don't answer the phone or you disguise your voice. <laughs> Hello, man. Speak to Les Brown, please. Sorry, but he's not here. <laughs> you sound like Les Brown. Don't go there, big boy. <laughs> Angela, I don't know. I used to be so broke and walk past the bank and trip the alarm. <laughs> Creditors would call the house and children would answer the phone and say, my daddy say he ain't home. <laughs> Maybe we were in a recession. I guess that's what it was, huh? We just didn't know. Sometimes you need to be intelligently ignorant. <laughs> Okay, so I took on myself. Can you tell? <laughs> I love this life. I do. I want to share a scripture with you this morning. Isaiah 43. Remember ye not the former things, neither the things of old. Behold, I shall do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. I want you to think about your goals, your personal goals, your professional goals, and your social goals. My personal goals have changed. My mother has since passed. She was a 22-year breast cancer conqueror. My goal now is to reduce the number of women who die from breast cancer in honor my mother. My goal, thank you is to reduce the number of men who die from prostate cancer. I'm a 12-year prostate cancer conqueror because of God's grace and mercy. My PSA is I speak, which stands for prostate-specific antigen. It's 471. And I'm cancer-free, debt-free, and drama-free. My goal is to impact young people. One of the dreams I have is working with my son, John Leslie. I went out to Los Angeles to be where my son went out to pursue his dream. A dream that I tried to discourage him from doing. Because I didn't agree with the dream. And fortunately, and to his credit, he fought me on that. So I want you to speak. He said, I can speak, but that's not my passion. I can do that in my sleep. I want to inspire young people. And they... They can't hear it from you in the way in which you give it. And I have to give it in my own voice. Repeat after me, please. I have my own voice. And so one of the things that I'm doing now, just with the inspiration of him, is teaching people how to find their power voice. How to begin to use your voice in the beginning was the word. How to use your voice to sell your business, your ideas, your inventions, your concepts, how to begin to change your life, how to develop strategic relationships, how to begin to create new chapters in your life with your voice. Most people never understand their whole lives how, empower, how important it is that they discover their power voice. You have a voice in you that you don't even know right now. And there are some of you, as I speak, you can feel me in your heart. I'm only speaking to you. Some of you hear me with your ears. But some of you can feel me in your heart. And those of you that are here, you're here because that there's something in you that is more in your life right now than you are expressing. And you can feel it. You can sense it. And, and you want to get unstuck. You're frustrated. You've done everything you could, and things have not worked out. And life has caught you in the blind side. I know about that. It seems like the harder you work, the deeper the hole you dig for yourself. Sometimes you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. 
You want to give up. You want to throw in the towel. Things happen to you, and sometimes life can, can hit you from so many sides, you don't even know where to fall. Call life. So I want you to think about some goals. Maybe your goal is to be financially free. That's a good thing. That's good, to be debt-free. It's a good feeling. I can tell you that, to be debt-free, to be cancer-free, and to be drama-free. It's a wonderful way to be. I'm going to share with you a strategy, some power strategies. Do I have your permission for that? I want to share with you some things that you can do that will allow you to move from your power. From the place that you have within yourself to accomplish and do things that you don't even know. This ministry, had it not been for this ministry, when Jack Boland looked at me and said, Peggy, book him for four weeks. That's what they used to have the Wednesday night meetings. I didn't think I had four weeks. I felt I had two good speeches. I said, <laughs> so I said, I'm booked two of those weeks. <laughs> I said, but I can do two. I got two in me. And he booked me for two. And I came out and did two weeks in a row. And then after that, I was able to do four. I had to get myself together. And you, you know, sometimes you got to just take small steps. Can you feel a brother up in here, up in here, you know? <laughs> so I just took those little small steps and just to get it together. I want you to think about your personal goal. Mine now is to train and develop speakers. Mine is to reduce the number of men who die from prostate cancer. Encourage men to get their PSA test and a digital rectal examination. And of course, you know, I'd be glad they can check our prostate by looking in our ears. <laughs> can you feel a brother up in here? Up in here. <laughs> I'm turning red, but y'all can't see it. <laughs> oh, I hate that test. Oh, my Lord. Last time I went to the doctor, went and gave him the petroleum jelly and the gloves. I said, come on, you don't know me like that. Give me some M&M peanuts, some potato chips. We got to talk. We got to get to know each other. This is our first date up in here. <laughs> you just can't run up on me like that. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> oh, behave, baby. It's this new medication. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I want you to think about your professional goals, and I want you to expand them. I want you to dream extreme. Don't limit yourself. And don't worry about how you're going to do it. How you're going to do it is none of your business. <laughs> Tell you what I know. I now coach people. I'm showing people how to begin to move their lives to another level. That's a whole other piece I'll tell you about. I want you to think about personal goals, family goals. One of my goals is working with my children. One of my sons will be coming up to speak for you very shortly. And we're working with people, coaching them in a process we've discovered that works extremely well and people have gotten incredible results from it. Not only finding their million dollar voice, but how to begin to activate their ideas and take it to another level. How to begin to engage the family in the process. How many of you that have children, raise your hands please. Good. How many of you would like to be able to work with your kids, help take them to another level? Raise your hands, please. Good. We, we do that and showing you how to make that happen. And then I want you to think about your social goals. What would be changed because you showed up? My, my oldest daughter, Ona, she lives in Atlanta. She called me, said, Dad, I want to talk to you. I got a few moments now because a policeman just pulled out on a motorcycle to stop traffic, obviously. She said, there's a funeral. And then when we started to talk, she said, whoa, wow. I said, what's wrong? She said, I can't believe that. I said, what? She said, uh, the, the hearse went by, but there were only two cars behind it. She said, when I die, I want to be a long line. I want my life to be impactful. I want people to come out to say goodbye to me in the celebration of my new life. How many of you want your lives to count? Raise your hands, please. I saw this movie by Jack Nicholson called About Schmidt. And there are some movies that you could see time and time again. Then you see something or hear something you did not hear before. Have you ever had that happen? I went to the bookstore today and I got some books that I've had before, read before. But because my life is in a different place, those books would have a different meaning to me right now. And my life was in a different place when I saw this, this part of the movie that I'd seen before by Jack Nicholson. And about Schmidt, about Schmidt, his life was not what he wanted it to be. He was frustrated. He was angry. He was in a marriage where they were dying together rather than living together. 
He had fell short of his goals. He decided to do something good with his life. He decided he wanted to make a difference in somebody's life. He adopted a little boy named Nduku. He wrote him a letter, and when he would write Nduku a letter, to send his contributions to Nduku, he would talk to him about all the things that was going on in his life. At the end of the movie, I caught this piece. He said, Nduku, when you die, and everyone you know dies, unless you have done something significant with your life, it will be as if you were never born. Whoa. I had to play that back. In Duku, when you die and everyone you know dies, unless you have done something significant with your life, it will be as if you were never born. And I want, to, want you to think about what, what will your mark be? What will be different? How much time do you have left to do that? I speak with a sense of urgency because on inauguration day, I went out to spend that day for that historic moment with my son, John Leslie. We went to the bookstore, and, and being the kind of people that we are loving books, bought about 500 books, and, and I was carrying them in both hands. And I should not have been doing that, but I was being aggressive and, and taking care of myself physically because I had a medical intervention that came out of nowhere. Uh, I've been on stage and I can do 142 push-ups straight and couldn't do that when I was 21. Here I am now at 65 and 90 days ago, I had angioplasty. Two major procedures within four days of each other. I was in a meeting, one of my speakers, Dr. Julianne Putten, Van Putten, she saw me in a meeting and I did like that and she said her intuition told her, she's a PhD and a medical director, that blood was, it was being complicated, going to my brain and, and she said after the meeting, you need angioplasty. I said, is that right? Yes, yes. She said, I just believe that you've got some blockage. You have shortening of breath? I said, no. You have pain in your chest? I said, no. She said, I'm surprised. I see all those push-ups you do. She said, but I think you need to go get that checked out. I said, what's the downside of angioplasty? She said, death. I said, oh, no. <laughs> Homie ain't going to do that. And so she convinced me to go to see this intervention cardiologist, and he was at the meeting where I had spoken and he looked at me and said oh this guy's in good shape he doesn't need it and so she continued to talk to him he said well come in tomorrow morning for a stress test but she called my son that night calvin fortunately for me and said look you need to talk to your father if you want your father to see your children and your children's children you need to convince him that he needs to be on that table in the morning i'll take care of the doctor and this doctor was so convinced i didn't need it he went through my arm through my wrist rather than my groin because it's close to the heart but more complicated he expected only to be in there 30 minutes was in there for three and a half hours i woke up during the procedure i said hey why are these lights going on and off mr brown please don't move you're in tim russet country what do you mean by that you have over 95 percent blockage sir please don't move don't move we're trying to avoid doing quadruple bypass surgery And so they put in three stents that day, had to wait four days later, put in two more. And then 30 days later, I'm with John Leslie walking in L.A. with my son. Dad, let me take the bags. John Leslie, I'm great. I flew out two days later when I got out of the hospital. I'm in good shape. He says, Dad, let me take No, son, I've got this. Then all of a sudden, I start feeling a chest in my pain, my chest, a pain in my chest. I said, John Leslie... I said, I'm feeling a presence in my chest. It's, it's very strange. He said, are you all right? I said, no. I said, I think, I think I need to, I need to talk, I need to talk to Dr. Capers. And I said, get my phone. And, and we called him and he, he said, Mr. Brown, where are you? I said, in LA. He said, go to Cedar Sign our hospital immediately. Give them this information in this order and they'll take you immediately. And then the doctor came and, and he looked at me and he said, you need angioplasty tomorrow morning. I said, I just had two angioplasty procedures. He said, whoa, 
I must tell you, this is going to be very dangerous. I don't know anyone who's had three angioplasties in less than 30 days and live. I want to say, what you talk about, Willis? <laughs> And, and God had been trying to talk to me, you know, but I wasn't listening. But he said then, can you hear me now? <laughs> I said, you got to do this. I'll be good. I'll be good. <laughs> I'll do whatever you tell me to do. No, you won't. No, you won't. You need this. No, 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 no. I really don't need this. No, please. I don't need this. I'll be good. You got to do this. You got to do me like this. I'll be good. No, you need to stop. You need to stop. Charles, you don't sit in life. When you have a teeth rattling experience and the very foundation of your life has been shaken, we run to God only to discover that it was God that was doing the shaking. And so, as a wake-up call, let me share something with you. If you've lost a job, if you've gone through bankruptcy, if you have lost your retirement, all of those things are traumatizing. When I was going through the foreclosure with the first house I bought for my mother, it was a traumatizing experience. I know the Bible says in all things give thanks, but to be honest, I couldn't be thankful on that day. To be honest with you, I was angry. To be honest with you, I was upset. To be honest with you, I felt broken. To be honest with you, when we packed up and had to go back to Liberty City, I was embarrassed. I felt humiliated. I was crying like a baby. It was not this confident Les Brown that you see now. Oh, no, 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 no. It was a different kind of Les Brown that showed up on that day when I had to pack our things and go back to the roach infested house that I had moved my mother out of. I remember something on that day though. I remember when I was unloading the truck, taking the furniture off, crying and feeling stupid and people said, Mamie, you're back? Yes. What happened? My boy lost a house. He didn't do a title search, but it's all right. And I've said, God, why would you let this happen to me? Why would you let this happen to me, my God? I'm just trying to do the right thing. Why would you let this happen to me? And I was unloading the truck. Mama came by the truck and she came in the back. She looked and she said, boy, hold your head up. I said, Baba, I feel so stupid. I said, hold your head up. I said, I can't, Mama. She said, hold your head up. <laughs> when she did that, when she pulled my head up, I saw a new house. Repeat it after me, please. Hold your head up. Your head up. Everybody do this right now. It's something, you know, when people, when, you, when, when you're depressed, it shows up physically. You have your head down. And now, this time you have to hold your head up. I start walking with my head up because I saw that new house, 12-foot deep swimming pool. I saw that new house, 10,000 square feet. I saw that new house didn't have the money at that time. My speaking was not where it is right now. I was just beginning. I saw, I saw. You got to hold a vision of where you're going. You got to see it. You've got to call forth those things that be not as though they were. Because it's your time. In the midst of all the stuff that's going on, you've got to know it's your time. You've got to feel favored. You've got to feel that God's hand is on your life. You've got to feel that something new and powerful and beautiful about to take place in your life. Everybody can't do that. See, it's easy to have faith when you have money in the bank, you have your retirement, you have your health. No one has looked at you and said, you have cancer. It's easy to have faith. Your marriage is working out. The children acting like they have good sense. It's easy to have faith. <laughs> Are you feeling, brother, up in here, up in here? It's easy to have faith. When everything's working out, you're not in any pain. It's easy to have faith then. But the true test is when life comes knocking on the door. That's, that's it. That's when it takes courage. That's when we're told, be of good courage. That's when we have to say, even, we, even though we have no evidence to support it, that's the time we have to say, it's my time. Come, John Leslie, come. Give John Leslie a round of applause. Thank you.
It's such a pleasure to be back at my home, too. Just by a show of hands, how many people were here when me, my father, and my sister came a couple of years ago? Okay, great. It's so great to be back with you all, and I have a status report. <laughs> you know, oftentimes, I get asked the question, you're Les Brownson? Wow, you are so fortunate. What is it like? <laughs> and y'all know my dad is crazy. And what I would like to talk to you about today, I would say that I'm blessed to be the child of one of the top five speakers in the world because he is a fantastic speaker, but I definitely. God really blessed me, though, with a great father. And the things that I've been able to learn from being around him and actually having him in my life is priceless. And I want to share some of those things with you. Last time when we were here, I talked about a principle that I realized. And see, when you grow up in an environment like this church provides, when you grow up feeding your children principles that you know are true and real, they, they grow up with a different mentality and a different mindset. And so I created some things when I was a teenager that I look back now and say, whoa, how come you can't be more like that now? <laughs> and one of the things that I did, I talked about last time when the experience when my dad put me on punishment. And he talks about uh, recessions restores resourcefulness. Well, so will punishment, too. <laughs> all, all the kids in the audience do understand what I'm feeling. And when he put me on punishment, my dad, for those of you all that weren't, were not here, he didn't put me on a regular punishment, no. He took away the keyboard to my computer so I could just see my screensaver. He took away my telephone, then he put me on room arrest, which meant two bathroom breaks and one dinner break. Then he took the door off of the hinges of my room and said, every time I walk by, you better be studying. Now parents don't get any ideas. But while I was studying, while I was in there, and I was so committed to, to not achieving academic excellence. I, I was so committed to not doing my best that I would only read motivational books when it was time to study because that's what I enjoyed. And I read this quote by Jim Rohn, and he said, your life, my life, the lives of each and every one of us will serve as either a warning or an example. Your life, my life, the lives of each and every one of us will serve as either a warning or an example. It went on to say a warning of lack of discipline, lack of drive and ambition, or an example of objectives clearly perceived and intensely pursued. See, when you look at me, I don't want you just to see, wow, he has a great father, because, see, it's easier having a father that is known for their greatness. But we all have great parents. We all have powerful people that sacrifice for us to be where we are today. So I want you to repeat after me. This is something that I've realized that, that was important for me to do, and I believe it's important for all of us here. Everyone say with power and conviction, carry the torch. Carry the torch. Yes. See, I realized when people, when I was young, I wanted to get away from my dad's messages. I wanted not to be like my dad, but now I'm at the point where I'm, I'm matured and I realized somebody's got to carry the torch. Somebody's got to keep this thing going. And so no matter what point that you are in your life, and, and your parents might not be one of the top five speakers in the world. They might not be a millionaire. They might not bring you in environments like this where you can pour into yourself. But they put a torch inside you that you must take with you at all times. And part of the way that I've been able to do that is a principle that I developed when I was young. 
See, when my dad put me on punishment, he put me on punishment before I got my report card. I said, Daddy, hold on. I I've been checking the mail. I know you haven't seen my grades. What happened? He said, John Leslie, I don't care about your grades. I can tell you're doing, getting poor grades based on how you're using your downtime. I said, hmm, this downtime thing, what is that? You know, I had to figure it out because it was giving me away. So I had to figure out, what is this thing called downtime? What is this? And it, it, it occurred to me, and this is worth writing down. The reason why they call it downtime is because that's the time when most people engage in the activities that prevent them from going up in life. I'll repeat that. The reason why they call it downtime, the reason why he knew that I was not doing my best is because that's the time that most people engage in the activities that prevent them from going up in life, that prevent them from taking their life to another level, that stop them from, from carrying the torch that we place, that get put inside them at an early age. And so I started to think about, okay, repeat after me. Maximize, Maximize. your downtime. I said, I got to maximize this downtime. I've got to do a new thing with my life. And I realized that we can maximize our downtime if we are more dedicated to our destinies than we are to our distractions. You can maximize your downtime if you are more dedicated to your destiny than you are to your distractions. Raise your hand if you've ever been distracted, if you ever had your attention, knowing that it should be focused on your truth, your light, your affirmations, the things that you have been doing to keep a, a, just a decent mind. <laughs> and, and you weren't able to do it, and so this is part of the way that I've been maximizing my downtime. I've realized... Listen, there's a lot of negative energy out there. There's a lot of negative words being poured into our youth today. And so I used to say a quote when I spoke. I, I said that if you could turn on the radio and learn how to be a thug, you should be able to turn on the radio and learn how to be a thinker. And that was a statement that I said, and I really meant that statement. And then I came to a place where in maximizing my downtime, I realized, hey, it's not enough to complain. One must correct. So who else better to get kids not to focus on a negative image? Who else better than Les Brown's baby boy? <laughs> so I just have a status report for you all. Since I've been here, I've been maximizing my downtime. And I remember just having the vision. I said, I want to make some songs. You know, I want to be able to make songs so that you can bob your head and listen to the music and not even know you're listening to Les Brown's principles. And at the time when I, I just finished reading a book series called Conversations with God. And um, OK, I, yes, woo, that's how I felt when I read it. And, and I said, you know, I could do this. At the time, I did not have any songs. I did not have any friends in the music industry, no connections whatsoever. I didn't even think that I could make a song. Well, now, ladies and gentlemen, I have over 200 motivational songs with no profanity, with content that you've heard from here at the Church of the Day, and I just made my first product. Give me a round of applause. And so we all, raise your hand if you realize the importance of listening to positive materials, programming yourself to success. Well, now we have a method, we have a tool that you can use to program you and your entire family with music and my dad's speeches that was given right here at this church. So I present to you one of the pieces that is on this album. It is the first song I ever made, entitled Live Your Dreams. I got a dream, dream. 
Something like Dr. King. Let's teach our children that money isn't everything. I got a dream, dream. Something like Dr. King. Let's teach our children that money isn't everything. I got a dream, dream. No, I didn't say a drink. But don't let the party stop just because a speaker thinks. I would never wear any diamond that was pink. But will you value my mind more than you value my mink? If not, then our value is guaranteed to shrink, and generations to come are guaranteed to sink. Live your dream. Just a little tad piece of what you'll hear on the album. But I remember I was just thinking about talking about being programmed. Thank you, thank you. I just wanted to give you a sample. I just wanted to give you a sample because my dad really asked me to share something that was created shortly after I spoke here the first time. And this piece is called It's Your Time. I wrote this when I was 14, and this shows what happens when you start to program your children at an early age. It's your time. You know who I'm talking about? You. You can't live like this forever. You know what I'm saying is true. Stop acting like what you have is enough. It's time to leave the stage behind and be real, and you know there's nothing real about what you're doing. You're lying to yourself. Don't you want to be happy? Don't you want more out of life? Well, then tell yourself that satisfaction isn't enough. You want fulfillment. It's not a question of whether or not it's possible. Conquering is part of your description. It is in your nature. The will to overcome and produce was designed to be a part of your genetic makeup. Wake up, wake up, wake up. What is it that you're doing? What made you stop pursuing? Sure, it's hard and it takes time. Sure, you might lose comfort and sleep. But so what if that's all you've got to be truly filled full? No more self-doubt. No more self-destruction. Just self-discipline and self-development. If you consider yourself a child of God then start showing some of your father's traits. Just do it and don't stop working until your life has meaning. I thank you for having me back in my home. John Leslie. This is his new CD. Uh, They call him High Hopes. High Hopes for Your Future. And we're going to be in the receiving line. I want to give you some notes, five power steps to make it through these times. How to survive and keep your dream alive. Step number one, write this down. Let us say together, be thankful. thankful. Yeah, see, be thankful. In the midst of all of the things that's happening to you right now, one of the reasons I realize now why my mother said, keep your head up, She said, we still have each other. We have a tendency when bad things happen to focus only on the bad things. What we want to do is begin to look for the good things, look for the blessings that we have been neglecting and taking for granted. Because whatever you focus on the longest becomes the strongest. So you want to begin to look at your life from a different place. Anybody can look at it from the negative perspective when bad things happen. But a person of faith can stand back, begin to observe, and understand. Think it not strange that you face the fiery furnaces of this world. You will have tribulations. Stuff's going to happen to us. It's called life, and we have to handle it. Life is like a roller coaster. Sometimes you're up. Sometimes you're down. Sometimes things work out. Sometimes they don't work out. It's called life. Next is, let us say together, be thoughtful. thoughtful. Yeah. So you want to look for ways to strategize, to get ahead, and look for opportunities that you can begin to create. As I looked at my life when I went to Miami from Ohio and resigned from the Ohio legislature, no college education, had to start all over again from scratch to take care of my mother, that's how I got into motivational speaking. That gave birth to a part of myself that I did not know. And so you want to begin to start thinking about and observing your life from a place of power, knowing that there are other opportunities and you have more in you. How many saw Lion King? Remember that line, Simba, you're more than that which you have become. Life is calling on us to go up higher, be thoughtful, and ask the question, what is this? Let us say together, be positive. positive. 
Yeah, see, you, this is the time that you have to invest in yourself. They're talking about what is a good investment right now. Let me share something with you. Beyond the stock market, beyond Wall Street, beyond real estate, you are your most important investment. I can tell you what I did. I invested in myself going to seminars and workshops and reading books. You want to have a program for yourself every day. Feed your mind, faith, so that your doubts can starve to death. Don't watch the television. <laughs> Let somebody else give you the Reader's Digest version of it. You don't need that stuff in your mind. It will poison your mind. It will poison your spirit. It is not good for your mental and spiritual well-being to expose yourself to the newspaper, to negative conversations from people. You don't want to hear about the bad news because you don't want that to be your reality and you don't want to be a carrier of bad news. Spend time working on yourself every day. I fortify myself before I leave the house and I have one reminder. Lord, whatever I face today, together you and I can handle it. Here's the other piece that's very important. Not only must you work on yourself, listen to motivational messages, go to seminars and workshops, and surround yourself with quality, positive people. Here's the next thing is, let us say together, be active. Yeah, yeah see, you don't want to just plan and strategize. You want to start moving. You want to start acting on some ideas and testing some new things. And now I'm working with my son. I'm training and developing other speakers. At this stage of my life, I will only give four speeches a month where I used to give four and five a week. At this stage of my life, I'm thinking now, I have the Les Brown Speakers Bureau. It's better for me to have 25% of 100 speakers than 100% of myself. I gotta start thinking. Gotta do things differently now. At this stage of my life, I got to reinvent myself. We gotta be willing to die to who we've been to give birth to who we can become. I found this, Marion White said this, in life when you don't have enough courage and insight to know you have outgrown a situation and it's time to move on, life will move on you. <laughs> I don't think people, four million people lost their jobs in the last few months. I think that four million people have been out of alignment with a higher calling on their lives and they have been released so they can now do that which they were chosen to do. <clears throat> Had I not been fired from WVKO because I didn't have enough insight or courage to know that I had been a disc jockey long enough, I would never been become a state legislator. Had I not been fired, I'd have never became a motivational speaker. Had I not been fired, I'd have never became an author. Had I not been fired, I'd never produced a special for PBS, over eight and another one coming out this year. Had I not been fired, I'd never had the talk show. Had I not been fired, I'd never met Jack Bowler, never been to this church. You would not have known me had I not been fired. Helen Keller says, when door, one door closes, another door opens, but most of us spend so much time looking at the closed door, talking about the closed door, we don't see the open door. Oh no, you haven't been fired. You're about to be blessed. Willie Jolly was right, a setback is a setup for a comeback. Shake someone's hand on your right and left and say, you've got comeback power. Here's the other thing. Let us say together, be connected. Be connected. Yeah, you want to surround yourself with like-minded people. You want to begin to look at your relationship. One of the things that John Leslie says, we work together with families. Who can you count on and who should you count out? You got to look at your relationship and ask the question, what is this relationship doing to me? Is it building me up? Am I growing mentally and spiritually? These people that I, I have synergy with, energy with, we can brainstorm and begin to put our thoughts together, develop a plan of action, how we're going to move forward. Ladies and gentlemen, there's some great opportunities out here right now. Great opportunities out here right now. That a lot of people, they're looking at the so-called economy and saying, what will the, the, the stimulus package be? What will the recovery be? Yeah, create your own recovery. Stimulate yourself. I wasn't worried about the president's first 100 days. I was too busy living my own first 100 days. I'm not waiting for the government to deliver me. Trust me on that. I saw Katrina. I'm not waiting for nobody. 
You can wait if you want to. <laughs> Hook up with some people that are serious. And you detoxify your life. There's some people you need to let go right now. There are people who are always there when they need you. I'm telling you, stay away from flaky, negative, energy-draining people that are not good for your health. A new term in, in psychiatry called relational illness. There's some people that can make you sick. <laughs> and if you never saw them again, it would be too soon. <laughs> Let us say together, be patient. Be patient. Write that down. Yes, you see, everything will happen when it happens. When will a baby walk? It will walk when it walks. Some walk sooner than others. When will it talk? It will talk when it talks. When will I live my dream? You will live it when you live it. I've come to find that a dream has a life of its own. And it will take you through all kind of trips. You hear me? Just buckle up. What happens when you get on a plane? Before they take off, what do they tell you to do? Fasten your seatbelt. Buckle up. Because when you're going from one vibration to the other, all hell will break loose. People will lie to you. People will steal from you. People will rip you off. And don't go around telling everybody what happened to you. 80% don't care and 20% glad as you. <laughs> so be patient. You got to trust. You got to have the mindset and repeat after me, please. No matter how bad it is. Or how bad it gets? I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. Yes, yeah, that's the kind of mindset you got to have. You got to be willing to throw down. You got to be willing to fight right now. I want you to remember this quote Life is a fight for territory. And once you stop fighting for what you want, say it after me. And once. You what you don't want will automatically take over. Do you get that? Life is a fight for territory. And once you stop fighting for what you want, what you don't want will automatically take over. I have to exercise every day. I kick Kansas butt every day. Every day. Who's trying to take me out? And you can't let your guard down. I can't eat anything that I want to eat. I have to exercise. Don't want to, but I will do it. Why? Because I plan to be here a long time. <laughs> Repeat after me, please. Do what you know, do what you know. Not, what you feel. not what you feel. See, most people do what they feel. Well, I don't feel like it. It's not what about whether or not you feel like it. Do what you know. Handle your business. Here's the other thing. Be persistent. Say that, be persistent. be persistent. Yeah, you gotta be persistent. You gotta come back again and again and again and again. You gotta be persistent. Keep on, come on. You can't get through the front door. I remember a guy knocking on my door one day. He started knocking, I wouldn't answer the door. He went around the side, said, hey, Les, Les. <laughs> Still didn't answer, start, took his shoe off, started hitting with, hey, Les. I, I said, man, what you want? I said, I wanna see you. I said, all right, Lord, have mercy. He was persistent. <laughs> How many of you seen people like that? Get on your last nerve, right? That's what you got to do. You, you got to be persistent. You know, my daughter wrote a book called, Are Your Angels Unemployed? <laughs> Some people, angels in the spa, getting their nails done, feathers being clipped. Oh, he ain't doing nothing today, honey. Go ahead, get my toes too. <laughs> she ain't doing nothing. She ain't busy. She just stopped. She tried two times and somebody said no, and she went home. No, you got to be persistent. Let's say together, be creative. be creative. We used to have mayonnaise sandwiches. Peanut butter and sugar <laughs> sandwiches. You, you gotta be creative. <laughs> Let me tell you something here. You gotta be creative. I never forget, I was called around to get speaking engagement. They said, how much you charge? I didn't know how to charge. I said, well, how much have you allocated? <laughs> they said, $5,000. I said, that'll do, that'll do, that'll do. <laughs> you gotta be creative. 
You got to be creative. I went to this event and people were putting in proposals to get money from the city of Miami. I didn't have any proposal. I went to the drugstore, walked around, some said, get a roll of paper. I got some paper and got me a little envelope and put a rubber band around it and wrote my name, Les Brown, Youth Enrichment Seminar. Brought it there and put it on the table. I said, members of the committee, I want to thank you so much for, for inviting me here today. I said, I know my name is not on the list, but I put it on the list because I know you want somebody to show up with a program that's going to make a difference in this community. And I'm that person. I said, be careful for what you ask for because I just showed up. I said, I have here 500 sheets of paper, and you know it would not be cost effective for me to duplicate it and give all of you a copy. Am I correct? They said, right. I say, do I have your permission to give you the Reader's Digest version? They said, yes. I said, I believe we can have little league football teams and baseball teams and basketball teams. We can have little league dermatologists and cardiologists and endocrinologists. And my program is designed to give young people the tools they need to carve out a future for themselves. They said, Mr. Brown, how much have you charged? I said, how much have you allocated? Well, sir, we have a big budget, but just tell us what do you charge? The last person went up before me, they charged $125,000. I said $175,000. I play bid whist, game called bid whist, come high, stay home. They said $175,000, that's the biggest one we had today. I said, I got the biggest program. Repeat after me, please, absolute faith. You got to have absolute faith. Don't you go around looking broke. Don't you define yourself based upon how much money you don't have in the bank. Oh, absolutely not. You got to walk with a definite like you got it going on up in here. You know, you, yeah, no, you, you, you're not broke. You just go, you got a cash flow problem. That's all that's going on. <laughs> I tell you. They gave me the contract for $150,000. They said, Mr. Brown, Go to the register and submit your name and social security number. Mr. Brown, yes? Go to the register and submit your social security number. I didn't answer immediately because I'd have spoken in unknown tongues. <laughs> I couldn't believe they gave me that money. I was so happy. <laughs> okay, you gotta be creative. All right, here's the other thing. Let us say together, be concerned. Be concerned. See, you wanna be concerned, but you don't wanna be consumed. You want to be concerned about what's going on, but don't let that trip you out. Just acknowledge it. You're not denying it. You're defying it. Does that make sense? And you're working on a plan of action. Here's the last one. Let us say together, be faithful. Be faithful. Yes. Be faithful. Hold your head up, Leslie. Yes, ma'am, mama. Yes, ma'am. Learned a lot on that day. In the midst of my tears, in the midst of feeling defeated, learned something. And I want to give this to you. When we look at life, they said life is like an onion. You have to peel it one layer at a time, and sometimes we cry. And in the midst of it, Keep your head up and know and expect that things are going to work out for you. Whereas my PSA was skyrocketing, I kept my head up. Doctor came and said, I'm sorry, sir. We gave you 238 radiation seed implants. There's nothing else we can do. Freezing it, having the surgery now, nothing else we can do. I left with my head up. I don't think doctors should tell people they're terminally ill. I think what they should say is my knowledge and ability to help you has terminated. Yeah. And it's something about being in alignment with your feelings, your feelings, your emotions, your words, your actions, and your spirit of expectation. There's something about that. Being in alignment in that way. I think that angels are dispatched. I has not seen. Things will happen for you that you can't even begin to imagine. Out of nowhere, I'm telling you what I know. Out of nowhere, help will come. You do what you can do and God will do what you can't do.
I'm telling you what I know. You have to fight. You have to fight. So I want to leave this with you. I am so glad to be here. I, you know, I, work, I work with a lot of people, but it's nothing like coming back home. I'll tell you that. It's nothing like it. I, I, I do apologize for going over. I, I want to... I want to leave this with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I want to leave this with you. I have a... I have a, a workshop called How to Survive and Keep Your Dream Alive. I want you to remember this. Write this down. Les at lesbrown.com. I want you to email me. If we get enough people to respond, I'm coming back in this area. And I like to do an intensive workshop that I've been doing in California, in Salt Lake City, Utah, and Phoenix, Arizona. I'm going to do it in New York. And people that have gone through this training, John Leslie and Owen and I, we do it together. It's an experiential process that teach you how to succeed where others are failing. Teach you how to take your ideas, your dreams, and make them big. Now, repeat after me, please. Expand, Expand. During, adversity. during adversity. See, this is no time to hunker under. This is no time to shrink. You can't shrink your way into greatness. You want to expand. Don't go where everybody else is going. You don't want to go from a place of fear. Fear, false evidence appearing real. Faith, finding answers in the heart. Oh, no, 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 no. When life knocked on your door, they knocked on the right door. Understand that. Don't underestimate yourself. I've been there, though. I've done that. People had to pray for me because I didn't have enough clarity of mind to pray for myself. But I'm back now. I want to thank Linda Poirier and the board for giving me the opportunity to come back here and, and spend these moments with you. And if you can feel me in your heart, email me at Les, that's my personal email, at lesbrown.com. Get enough people. I, I went out to Los Angeles to be with my baby boy, to be around him, to be with him. I, I don't know what it is to have a father. When I'm working with my son, I look at him. I don't know what that's like. And I, I know that I'm a much better father as he's older now than I was when he was younger. If I knew better, I would have done better. We can't pay back but we can pay forward. Does that make sense? The things I've done in the past, when I look back, I would do them differently. Things I'm not proud of. Things I'm ashamed of. Things if I had it to do over again, but I don't have it to do over again. I can't unscramble those eggs. And... And I have, that person died. I used to beat that person up. I was guilt-ridden for a long time because of what I didn't do. And I realized, and I was reading a book on forgiveness, if you wouldn't do the same things today as you did yesterday, then you're condemning an innocent man. Repeat after me, please. I must forgive myself. I had to forgive myself for a lot of things. A lot of things. God's been good to me. And I'd like to leave this with you. I want to thank you for your prayers, for how you, over the years, came here and saw me, your encouragement, for allowing me to be able to pursue my dream. And now in this new chapter in my life, I thank you so much for your showing up on this day and allow me to speak to you and that as we leave here today, I want to say to you and speak just to your heart that we were born for such a time as this. God had something in mind when he said, I want you, I want you, I want you. I want you. You were born for
this hour. In Duku, when you die, and everyone you know dies, unless you have done something significant with your life, it will be as if you were never born. I say you got up and got dressed and came here today because you want to make a mark with your life. I say you came here today because you felt in your heart of hearts there's more in you than you have been expressing. It's something, something you can't exactly put your hand on. You know things have changed and you've got to change. And now in the midst of all of this, I'm just reminding you of what you already know in your heart of hearts. And so I like to leave this with you and I look forward to hugging you, embracing you out in the lobby. And I encourage you to get John Leslie's CD, which is High Hopes for You, for Your Future. It's Possible. And it's simply this, and you know I'm known by this. My mother loved it. Leslie, yes, ma'am, mama, say that thing for me, boy, that makes me feel good. I dedicate this to you and to your dream. If you want a thing bad enough to go out and fight for it, to work day and night for it, to give up your time, your peace, and your sleep for it, if all that you dream and scheme is about it and life seems useless and worthless without it, and if you gladly sweat for it and fret for it and plan for it and lose all your terror of the opposition for it, and if you simply go after that thing that you want with all of your capacity, strength and sagacity, faith, hope, and confidence, and stern pertinacity, if neither cold, poverty, famish, or gulf, sickness or pain of body and brain can keep you away from the thing that you want, of dogged and grim, you besiege and beset it. With the help of God, you'll get it. This has been Mrs. Mamie Brown's baby boy. It's been a plum pleasing pleasure as well as a privilege. God bless you. God bless your dream. God bless Renaissance unity. God bless Renaissance unity. Thank you.